Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jess Richards, and I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Uh, the DNR, along with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, is a co-trustee for the 3M settlement. And uh, we're happy to be here tonight uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, the ongoing work with PFAS uh, in the area and also the state's work to work on a conceptual drinking water supply plan. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank the South Washington County Telecommunications Commission, who's uh, recording this event tonight and will be replaying it back on their YouTube channel. Uh, so folks can see that, those folks that decided to stay home and watch the Vikings today. Uh, I was told that I should probably give a Viking score update. I am not able to get it to go on my phone, so I'm sorry. I know Kurt, I know it's, it's you're right, it hasn't started yet. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we might have a couple Packer fans in the group too, so I don't know. Um, the, I also uh, want to thank Woodbury High School for hosting us. This is a great venue. You seem like you're far away from me right now. I might walk out in the crowd. Um, and also, just before we get started, uh, uh, I just want to thank, I noticed there's uh, a number of elected officials here today, both state uh, and local elected officials. Maybe you could raise your hand so folks know where you are. A uh, bunch of city council members, mayors, senators. Uh, so thank you all for coming and, and showing your support and engagement on this important to topic as well. And then I also noticed that we've got uh, a number of uh, members of our citizen and community and technical work groups here. These are the folks that are uh, helping us on a monthly basis, you know, helping us go through the data and the information, giving us advice on, on how to work on this subject. If you could raise your hands as well so folks know who you are, or your Canes Jack, that's great. Thank you very much. I hope you had the opportunity to spend a little time at the open house and, and talk to some of our technical experts. They'll be available, of course, all night and after the event as well if you want to talk to folks uh, after this is done, um, if you have additional further questions. We have four main topics that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Jim Kelly, uh, manager with the health department. And he's going to give you some background on PFAS chemicals, their health effects, and uh, the health department's water guidance. And then we're going to move into a presentation on PFAS sampling in the East Metro area by Ginny Yingling with the health department as well, a research scientist. And then finally, Kirk Kadelka, Assistant Commissioner with the Pollution Control Agency, will give you an overview of some of the history uh, leading up to the 3M settlement agreement and the work that's being done right now on the conceptual drinking water supply plan. Uh, just, you know, the work that's being done to meet the long-term needs for safe drinking water in the community. After these presentations, we'll have uh, additional time for question and answer, and all the folks, uh, including myself, will stay up here. Um, so we'd like you to hold your questions until the end, if possible, because we want to be able to get them all in the, the video. Uh, there's going to be a microphone that's going around, so please wait. If you have a question, put your hand up. Somebody with a microphone will come and uh, take your question, and then we'll have somebody provide that answer. Um, and we'll, we'll be able to go back and forth on slides. Ginny's got some pretty incredible uh, slides that are uh, similar to some of the pictures you saw outside. And so if we need to go back, we'll, we'll come back to those slides as well. Restrooms out the door, men to the right out the door, women's to the left out the door. And with that, I will turn it over to Jim Kelly from the Health Department. Thank you, Jess. Um, I'm Jim Kelly, as he said, with the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, we've been working closely with the Pollution Control Agency and the DNR and, and this particular issue of PFAS in the East Metro for oh, over 15 years. So we've, we've been studying this issue. We're here tonight to kind of share where things are at and how the work that the Health Department does fits in with the overall settlement work that Kirk's going to say a little bit more about later on. So I'm here just to say a little bit about what PFAS is and why we're here. So what are these chemicals? It's a large class of industrial chemicals. They're surfactants, which means they help other things move easily. Um, with unique chemical and physical properties, um, some of them are, because of this chemical nature, makes them very persistent in our environment. It takes a lot of energy to make these chemicals, to create them, and so that it takes a lot of energy to break them down again, too, and it's more energy that is just typically available in nature. So they, once they're manufactured by man, Nature has a really hard time breaking them down again. They've been used since the 40s in a, in a wide range of consumer products. Um, PFOS was the, this kind of signature chemical that 3M manufactured that was used in Scotchgard and similar kinds of products, um, stain repellents, et cetera. PFOA, which was another chemical manufactured at their Cottage Grove plant, was um, 
used to make nonstick coatings. So a lot of that was sold to DuPont and used to make in the, used in the Teflon manufacturing process. Also, as well in some other products where it had the properties of helping make things more stain resistant or waterproof, et cetera. So these chemicals have had very useful lives. They were very um, uh, intentionally made for their unique chemical properties and they worked really well for the applications they were developed for. But these same properties that made them so useful in, in these applications cause some kind of problems once they, once they get into the environment. Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit more about how that comes into play. Some of the most uh, cumulative, bioaccumulative and persistent of these chemicals, PFOS and PFOA especially, have been mostly phased out in the Western world. They're still used or manufactured to some degree in other parts of the world, but they've mostly been phased out of production and use here in the United States. So their levels are generally, overall in the environment, are declining, which is, which is good news. But they are in certain pockets where they were manufactured or disposed of, um, such as we have here, unfortunately, in Washington County is where we still see this, this issue. Oops, wrong way. Oh, it wasn't. So we'll talk a little bit about our water guidance that we've developed here at the Department of Health. So why do we do this work? We're charged under the state's Groundwater Protection Act from 1989 to develop criteria for chemicals um, that are found in our groundwater systems that are used as sources of drinking water. Um, we do this work um, to help our fellow agencies, such as PCA, uh, drive cleanup action so that if groundwater has been contaminated, it helps set the, the benchmark for them to help restore the groundwater to its conditions where it can be used in an unlimited fashion. Um, we're supported in part by Clean Water Land and Legacy Funds that's led to the creation of our Contaminants of Emerging Concern Initiative, which is the part of the program that, that I manage that looks at new chemicals, emerging chemicals, uh, of which PFAS may no longer necessarily be emerging, but it certainly was um, 10 or 15 years ago, very much fit that picture. So as I mentioned, PFOA, PFHXS, and PFOS, three of the chemicals in this family that we found here in the East Metro area, the, the kind of key issue with them that makes them such a concern is that they are eliminated very, very slowly from the human body. That is very low levels in water can build up or accumulate in your blood um, to where you have levels that might be, um, if they're part per, part per trillion levels in the water, you can end up with part per billion levels in the blood. Or part per billion levels in the water, you could end up with part per million levels in blood. So they accumulate very, um, very easily in the body. It takes your body a long time to accumulate them, just the way, same way it takes your body a long time to eliminate them. And I think that's an important factor to keep in mind. So it's kind of a long-term exposure that we're concerned with. So having a glass of water that might have something in low levels of, of these chemicals in them is not necessarily a concern. It's that consumption on a daily basis over many, many years that starts to drive up those serum, serum levels to levels where you might be concerned. <laughs> so the guidance values we've developed for these chemicals, um, the, the most toxic or accumulative ones, PFOS, PFOA, um, and PFHXS were developed um, based on this idea that the guidance values are based on the idea of trying to protect against um, excessive transfer of these chemicals from the mother to a developing fetus. We found out fairly early on that they can cross the placenta so that the developing fetus can also build up levels of these chemicals before they're even born. They're also excreted into breast milk, so that is also another pathway that, a, that an infant can be exposed right after birth. And because uh, very young infants typically drink a lot of water per their body weight, more than adults, that can build up even faster um, at, in very small infants. <clears throat> so we really had to try to take that into account somehow in developing guidance values for, for the most problematic of this family of chemicals. The goal of it is to keep those accumulated levels in the mom's to be uh, in her blood low enough so that exposure to that of her developing fetus and then her infant are below levels of concern. So that exposing our, our exposure to our very uh, most vulnerable population, that developing fetus and the infant, is really what this is based on. For everybody else, um, our guidance values are probably overprotective. In fact, we've calculated that they're likely to be overprotective. If if you're a guy. It's not, you could probably get by with a lot higher levels because we're not carrying fetuses and passing that on through breast milk. That's just the, the fact. But we have to protect that most vulnerable of populations. 
I want to stress that um, even though breastfeeding is one of the ways that can, that can lead to exposure to these chemicals, we really wanted to stress to, uh, to the communities out here that breastfeeding is really important for both the short and long-term health of an infant and for the mom both. And we want that practice to continue. I think the benefits far outweigh any small risks that would come from doing those practices or any small levels of contamination that would be passed on. So we want to stress that the benefits in this case likely outweigh the risks, but ultimately we want to protect um, those moms-to-be so that they don't have levels that would ever be of a concern. One of the questions that we get is that if you're, if you're looking at the science around these chemicals, uh, many states have developed guidance values along with the EPA, and, and oftentimes they're all a little bit different. Um, part of that is because this is a really fast-moving area of research. There's constantly new studies coming out. It's been a very active area. Sometimes we see up to 100 papers coming out in a month in the scientific literature. That's a lot. Um, so it's uh, keeping up with that and figuring out what's going on in the newest studies is, is, uh, is critical in this area. Sometimes there's differences due to timing. Uh, methods tend to change over time. And some, oftentimes the difference is that each state approaches this a little bit differently and might use different factors in the equations that we use to develop water guidance. This slide, it, again, is kind of busy, but it talks about some of the different factors that can differ between states. There are things like um, the, the, the how we look at the studies that we use, the animal studies that we use to derive these guidance values. So things like the, the NOEL, which is the term we use for the no observed effect level, how you might look at that and calculate that could be different from state to state. Um, uncertainty factors or safety factors, sometimes we apply them in slightly different ways where one state might use 30, another state might use 10, so you're gonna get a slight difference in the value there. Uh, Things like the drinking water consumption rate. We again use the value, drinking water consumption rates for that most vulnerable of our population, the, um, the very young infant breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Um, if a state's using an adult intake rate, that's gonna result in a slightly different value. So there's just, there's multiple different factors that can be just a little bit different, which is why you might say one state having a value of 15 parts per trillion, another one's 13, another one's 12. In our minds as scientists, they're virtually the same number, and these differences, minor differences, are due to variations in some of these factors that we apply. So these are the current guidance values that we have for the, for the, the PFAS chemicals that we monitor for in the groundwater and drinking water in the East Metro. Um, they vary in range from seven parts per billion for PFBA, that's the, a short chain chemical that has a very short half-life in the body. Your body clears that chemical in a matter of days versus PFOS or perfluorooctane sulfonate, the one right above it, that number's 15 parts per trillion because it takes your body many, many years to clear that chemical out. That's by and large the largest driving factors in these numbers. Um, so they, they have a very big range and, and that's why they look, the numbers are slightly different based on their, their, their properties. We also look at the combination of the chemicals together because they have similar, potential effects on the body. They can affect the development of, the, of, a, of a fetus, obviously, as I mentioned. They can affect the immune system. They can affect the liver and other systems. They all um, have similar effects. So we look at them if they're present in mixtures in the groundwater, which they often are in the East Metro. We look at the, the sum total, essentially, of the chemicals in the mixture and compare that to what we call a hazard index. Um, where we take the concentration of each of the chemicals divided by its guidance value, add that up, and if it exceeds one, it's pretty much the same thing as if one of them individually exceeded a guidance value. So we really try to, to look at the sum total of the chemicals together, so we're making sure that uh, if there's more than one present, we're, adequately, we're providing an adequate margin of safety to prevent exposure above the levels that we would, might be concerned about. So it's a very cautious approach. We're one of the few states that, that have this methodology actually promulgated into our rules, so it's gone through a rulemaking process and been reviewed. Um, but we think it's the most prudent and most health protective way to go about this. And I think I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to my colleague, Ginny Yingling, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, where we've been finding these chemicals and how they've been moving around the, the environment in the East Metro. So I'll turn it over to Ginny. Thanks, Jim. Jim said I'll talk a little bit, so that was a clue to me to keep it short, because <laughs> he knows how I can ramble. 
Um, so we have been doing a lot of sampling in the East Metro. So we started back in 2003. Uh, the, health or the Pollution Control Agency came to the Minnesota Department of Health in 2002 and said, that 3M had reported to them that they thought they had a problem with the water at their plant, and um, that made us all concerned that maybe there was a problem with water in other parts of the community. And so our lab quickly set to work to develop, an anal to develop analytical methods to test for these compounds. So starting in 2003, we could test for two of them, PFOA and PFOS. Um, the detection limits were relatively high, and so we didn't find much when we got going at first. Um, over the time that we've been doing this work, the detection limits have been uh, incrementally lowered um, several times, and that's allowed us to find more and more of the um, contaminants at very low levels down into the part per trillion range these days. So in that time frame, since 2003, we've collected over 13,000 uh, groundwater samples from a, a variety of wells. Um, approximately 3,500 wells in the East Metro um, have been sampled. 76 of those are community wells, like your city water supply wells, and then larger um, uh, supply wells for places like Eagles Watch Development and the Cimarron Mobile Home Park. 3,200 plus residential and non-community public wells, and those are things like schools, businesses, churches that are on a well, uh, anywhere that the public might be drinking the water, um, but not on a, a long-term or, or regular basis. So we've sampled quite a number of wells. For drinking water samples, we've got over 10,000 samples. Of those, 1,300 were collected from the community water supplies and about 8,900 or almost 9,000 from those residential and non-community public water uh, systems. And that's because some of the wells we've, re we've sampled more than just once. The city water wells are sampled on a regular basis. The more contaminated of the private wells get sampled regularly, and then we do what we call sentry wells throughout the affected areas to keep an eye on things in the aquifers to see if it's changing over time. Right now, we've been sampling about a thousand wells a year since 2016, ever since the EPA's uh, new lower lifetime health advisories were issued in May of 2016. We've um, upped our sampling um, and as we've lowered our drinking water advice since 2016, we've continued to do a lot more sampling to try and identify all the wells that may be in exceedance of our, our guidance values. Um, in that regard, we have well advisories and response actions going on in um, most of the affected communities. Oakdale, Woodbury, Cottage Grove, Lake Elmo, and St. Paul Park all have one or more city wells that have received um, advisories from the health department because of exceedances of our guidance values. And in each case, they've taken some action to address that. Um, the cities that have more wells are able to shut off some of the wells or use them on a very limited basis and um, rely on flow control using the cleaner wells and then only using the more contaminated ones when they absolutely have to, but keeping the, the overall concentration below our guidance values. Other cities like Oakdale, Cottage Grove, St. Paul Park, are in the process of, have either installed uh, carbon filtration systems or in the process of doing so. And um, both Oakdale and Cottage Grove and Lake Elmo have also either installed new wells or are in the process of doing so um, in, and installing those in areas that are not contaminated. Um, in terms of the residential and non-community public wells, we've issued over 1,250 drinking water advisories for those systems. The state, uh, through the Pollution Control Agency and their um, uh, emergency response system, as well as under a consent agreement with 3M, um, that funds this work, they provide bottled water as an interim uh, uh, measure, and then install either a whole house carbon filtration system, a granular activated carbon system, or they can, where it's possible, they connect people to city water. So that's occurred in Lake Elmo and uh, Lakeland and Lakeland Shores. 
This map gives you sort of a, a cartoon version of what's going on, kind of the big picture. Um, as Jim mentioned, this has been going on for a long time. There were three major disposal sites in the East Metro, and it's a little hard to see, but the little flags um, show where they're located. So there was, I don't know, do I get an arrow? Does that show up? Nope. Do we have a laser pointer? I've got a pen, but that doesn't help. All right, well, be as it may. There were uh, two major disposal sites north of Woodbury, one in Oakdale. Uh, the, um, it was a, a large uh, dump that was in a wetland area um, just to the west of the Menards off of 694, so you probably are familiar with that. The other was the Washington County landfill up in Lake Elmo, just south of Lake Jane. Um, PFAS bearing wastes from 3M were disposed of in those um, landfills as well as the Woodbury disposal site right on the border of Cottage Grove and Woodbury um, along Woodbury, Woodbury Drive or Keats Avenue. Um, and then there's also been some, uh, there was some waste disposed of on site at the Cottage Grove plant itself, but that from there, it just goes straight out to the river, um, the, the stuff that infiltrated there. All three of those sites, the contaminants, quickly went to the groundwater because none of those were lined landfills back then. We didn't line our landfills, unfortunately. And so um, very rapidly, these plumes probably established because these uh, chemicals are water soluble and very mobile in the environment. So it's likely that these plumes established very quickly starting in the late 40s, early 50s, and through the 60s and into the early 70s, at which time all of the sites were investigated because of industrial solvents that were being detected in people's water supply wells. And so site investigations and cleanups occurred at all three sites that started to reduce the amount of contaminants that were in the source areas and as well as putting in control systems, groundwater extraction systems to try and contain the contaminants on site, pull them out, treat them, and, and discharge them. The problem was we didn't know the PFAS chemicals were in there, and a lot of the treatment um, options did not address those chemicals. And so basically we pulled them out of the ground and sent them on their way. Um, the, so, so the other thing to note here is that we've got two major drainage features in this area. There's the Mississippi River on the west and south of the county, and then the St. Croix River on the east side. All the groundwater in Washington County is going to discharge to one of those surface features. And there's a divide that runs essentially north-south that cuts the county in half that determines which way the groundwater flows. On the east half, groundwater flows east-southeast towards the St. Croix, so I put a big blue arrow directed that way. And on the west side, there's the water flows south-southwest towards the Mississippi River, so again an arrow. And you can see the areas that are shown in green, which is PFOA, and black hash marking, which is PFOS, you can see that they're kind of following those trends depending on which side of the divide they're on. The brown area is PFBA, the one that Jim mentioned that's so water soluble. It's a small molecule. It doesn't like to stick to things like some of the other chemicals do. So once it's in the water, it takes off and it goes a long way. We also think there was probably airborne deposition of PFBA from the plant and also from other sources because no matter where we sample in Minnesota, we will find some PFBA in groundwater at some trace level. Up. 10, 20, 50 parts per trillion, no matter where we sample. So it's a very common contaminant, unfortunately, in the environment. The thing that's unusual, and um, it doesn't really affect Woodbury too much, but I know there are folks here from other communities, is how did we get all that contamination in West Lakeland Township if all the sites are on the west side of that groundwater divide and everything should have been going to the river. And the reason for that is there was an interconnected stormwater system that I'll show you in a second that helped move it across that groundwater divide and into West Lakeland Township. The other thing that's on this map are white dots that show all the wells that we've sampled over time to give you a sense that we have looked across the affected communities. And then the purple dots are where we have well advisories. And you can see how they cluster essentially wherever we have PFOA and PFOS. That's what's driving the drinking water advisories are those two chemicals because of the very low guidance values that we've set that Jim talked about. 
So when we look at the actual maps of PFOA on the left and PFOS on the right, this gives you a sense of the concentration trends within those plumes and, and where the high concentrations are in the reds, the darker reds and oranges, all the way out to yellow. Anything from yellow, orange, or red, those um, exceed that chemical's individual guidance value. So you can see the, the large areas up in Oakdale, Lake Elmo, West Lakeland Township, and then parts of Cottage Grove where we've got um, concentrations of PFOA that exceed, and then only up in um, Oakdale, Lake Elmo, West Lakeland Township, and a little bit of Woodbury, um, and then a very small part of Cottage Grove, way down near the plant, do we have PFOS that exceeds our guidance values out in the residential wells. And again, that's partly because PFOS is slightly less soluble, slightly less mobile than PFOA, so it doesn't go as far. Um, it also was at lower concentrations in two of the disposal sites, up especially the Washington County landfill in Lake Elmo. There was hardly any. By the time 3M was dis disposing of waste in that facility, they had shifted their chemistry primarily over towards the PFOA side of things, and so there's very little PFOS in there. And yet you can see down gradient, or southwest of the Lake El or the Washington County landfill, we've got high levels of PFOS. And that's what put us on to this surface water system that has spread the contamination across the groundwater divide. There's a creek that flows out of the wetlands at the Oakdale disposal site. It is contaminated with PFOS, PFOA, and the other chemicals. There was also uh, a groundwater extraction system at the landfill that went into a stormwater system that flowed into that creek for about a period of seven years that because we didn't know the PFO, the PFAS was in the water at the time, it seemed like a reasonable place to discharge that, the, the pump out water, but it ultimately was not. Um, but then in the late 80s, early 90s, the watershed district, in an attempt to control flooding on a number of the lakes in the Lake Elmo area, and to protect Lake Elmo, which is a high resource recreational lake, from stormwater inputs, they created an interconnected stormwater system. And this map is showing you with the dark blue arrows being surface water or stormwater, and the light blue arrows being groundwater mo movement of the chemicals. That interconnected system eventually brought the contaminated water from the Oakdale and the uh, Washington County landfill sites into Eagle Point Lake, across Lake Elmo, into West Lakeland through Horseshoe Lake, and then it's infiltrating throughout the course of a series of stormwater ponds and ditches and created a large area of contamination that's now moving out to the St. Croix River. So you can see all the infiltration as the blue arrows as it's moving along, and that's why we are now spending so much time in West Lakeland Township trying to identify all the homes that are affected there. And that gets me to sampling priorities. Um, out on the table, and I know some of you filled out forms, we've got some yellow forms. If you have a private well, we are, um, and you're within the affected areas, the, basically the areas shown in brown, we'll be glad to sample your well and test it for PFAS. Um, but we do have some priorities because we want to focus on people who may be the most highly exposed. And so our highest priorities are wells that are in or down gradient of the areas that have PFOS and PFOA um, and have not yet been sampled. Wells that are near those areas because we want to be sure we have defined the edges and have good buffers around the plumes. Um, and then we want to resample wells that have the health risk index that Jim mentioned, that, that additive value. Um, if it's greater than uh, 0 0.75, we want to get those resampled. That's our top priority. Next is to resample wells with a health risk index of over a, a 0 0.5. Resample any wells that have any PFOS or PFOA detections. And then a little lower on our list, we'll still get to them, but testing um, wells that are in those lower priority areas um, or um, testing people's filtered water if um, they have a filter system they installed or if they have a filter system that the state has installed. Um, I think we were going to save that for the end. 
um, if there were questions about city water. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Kurt, who's going to talk about the um, East Metro history and then the settlement. Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks, Jeannie. So I see a lot of uh, faces here that have been through this, uh, through these presentations. Some of these slides you may have seen already. We're going to go over them quickly. But I know there's a lot of new faces here today, too. And we want to make sure that they are provided uh, similar information. So while we may hit some highlights on these, if those folks have questions during the Q&A, please ask them. Or afterwards, we're more than happy always to provide additional information. What I really want to cover today is what we've been doing in the in the interim here, and then really what we're working with the 3M Natural Resources Settlement on long term. What, how we're going to do that, and especially upcoming steps that will need input from the communities. And uh, preview a little bit of that process uh, since we'll have some key dates coming forward in December, January, and February. As Ginny mentioned, we first became aware of PFAS being present in the environment in the East Metropolitan Area here in 2002. And over that time afterwards, MPCA directed 3M to continue to investigate where that was. One of the crucial items that I'll talk about is the 2007 consent order. It was a document that outlines what are the responsibilities of 3M at the disposal sites that Jeannie mentioned, but also dealing with uh, drinking water sources, whether it's private wells or city wells. And this document has funded a lot of work that we've seen, the sampling you've seen so far, and also the treatment systems have been put on private and public systems in the meantime. However, that's not the only damage that's been done as a result of the PFAS compounds. There are really a couple different programs under state and federal law that look at when areas are contaminated. And the first is the Superfund program, which looks at how are things uh, caused, working to do the cleanup after they've done the investigation, on determining the cause, and then uh, treating direct impacts on human health or the environment, such as drinking water wells. And that's what the consent order and that whole set of regulations and requirements on 3M is based under. However, that's not the entire amount of damage that's been done in the East Metropolitan area. There are a lot of natural resources, foremost the underlying aquifers of this area, which serve as the drinking water for these communities, are also been greatly impacted. In addition, we have fish advisories and, and advice not to consume fish, for instance, in Lake Elmo that have been impacted because of PFAS. So these are natural resources damages. So in 2010 and then uh, settled in 2018, the state of Minnesota uh, came to an agreement with 3M for what we refer to as the settlement. And that really looks um, at those natural resources damages. So I just want to highlight real quick the, the settlement. It was for $850 million to the state. Uh, a number of funds were used to, to start with, which brings uh, for a number of costs, including legal costs, expert witnesses, the investigations that were needed, and the research done to, to prove the case. That left $720 million immediately available for our priorities. And you see there are two priorities. The first being the groundwater and drinking water supply, making sure that not only today but into the future there's safe and abundant groundwater, excuse me, drinking water for the communities. And the second priority is the restoration and enhancement of the natural resources. I talked a little bit about the, the fish populations, for instance, and the damage that has been done to the underlying aquifer, but also our surface waters. This also has a strong understanding that this will not be something that just the MPCA and DNR have a role in making the decisions, but set out the idea of the creation of a work group. And so while the settlement, the settlement talks about creating one work group, we've actually created three different groups at this point. One is a citizen and business work group, which has residents and those who work within this area serve and advise the, the agencies as we move forward on this process. And a second is made up the local units of government themselves and 3M, and we call the government and 3M group. In addition to that, uh, below that we have a subgroup, which is very technical, and are, are the folks that are from the communities that know the water systems and do that type of work, so that we have a number of people from the community providing information and feedback to the agencies as we go through this process. The settlement I mentioned had those two priorities, the first and highest one being drinking water, that they're safe and, and, and sustainable amounts of drinking water, not only now but into the future. And we've been working on that through the working groups, and that's been where we spent our, our time on that first priority up to, 
to date. We know that the money uh, is there to achieve the goal is not uh, infinite, and so we believe that not only through effective planning but efficient implementation, we will be able to make this money go as far as we need and to be able to address things into the future. And how we really look to do that is that conceptual drinking water supply plan that was talked about earlier. This is a, a plan that will address all 14 communities within the East Metropolitan Area that have been impacted on not only addressing how the drinking water is addressed, excuse me, dealt with today, but also into the future. And so as uh, Ginny talked about, the private and municipal wells have had activities uh, going on through that, and that's been covered under the 2007 consent order. So it's not a situation where we're planning and nothing is going on in the actual communities to ensure uh, public drinking water and public health is protected. Those things are occurring at the same time. So we're addressing as we find areas where there may be wells over the health-based values, we're addressing them right away and while we're doing the long-term work. And so what is the conceptual drinking water plan? I mentioned that a little earlier. This is our plan for the 14 communities on how we want to address this long term. The key date here is where the goal is to have this done by March of next year. And this really is a five step process. And I just want to go over look uh, quickly on those five steps. Here they are in, in aggregate uh, and, and break them down on just the things that we've done already. The good news is we've accomplished three of these five steps already but to talk also about the next two steps and what that means uh, for the communities and the feedback and participation we need from the residents and businesses and the local governments in the area. The first is we had to build a base of knowledge of this region and that greatly came from information already produced by the local units of government, the watershed districts and other work that MPCA, DNR and Department of Health had already done in the area. I just want to highlight a couple things, and that's that bottom bullet point. We created a groundwater model for the entire region to be able to run future scenarios against, and also took all 14 communities' drinking water systems and put them together into one model so that we know if we do one thing at one end of the East Metro, how would that impact any other parts of the East Metropolitan area, which is going to be crucial as we look at planning for 14 communities and their drinking water systems long term. The next step we did is we identified a, a number of ideas and concepts of how would we address the drinking water supply long term. And so we looked not only at the municipal systems, but also private wells. And you can see the, the top three deal with private wells and how to address them moving into the future. And uh, as we move down more, we look at those are on a municipal level. So these are ideas that we started with and we got feedback from the work group on this effort. But we took those list of ideas then and then zoomed in on each community. So it's easy to say, well, we could put a treatment system on the city wells. Well, what does that look like for each of the communities? And that's what the conceptual level projects are. Looking at how many treatment systems are needed, uh, what type of technology to use for these communities or working communities together. We did this 14 times for each of the 14 communities, not only looking at city uh, drinking water, but also private drinking water. Some of these communities have both, and so there's a, a number of, of projects that we're looking at for each of the communities. And as you'll note there, the 3M Settlement website has a list of each of those conceptual projects. If you're interested, the website is 3msettlement.state.mn.us, and we have a drinking water tab that can bring you to this information. So this is the work that we've done at just a real high level and the next is, I talked about having to do this for the entire region. It's now bringing all those conceptual level plans and building bundles of it for scenarios that address the entire region. So that's what we're in the process of doing right now, and then eventually apply that to our groundwater model and also our uh, drinking water system model so that we make sure that we don't have any, un, excuse me, any unintended consequences. And as we look at systems, for instance, ideas may be interconnects to build uh, backup systems for some communities between two communities. Well, how does that affect the drinking water system of both of them? Does that work? Uh, many of the communities have different zones or different areas within their community with different pressures. Those things all need to be taken into account to make sure that the ideas that we propose actually can put, be put into effect later. 
And a very crucial part of this is determining the cost. And that's not only the cost of building these systems, but it's also the ongoing operation and maintenance of these systems into the future. And then eventually these systems may need to be changed out or upgraded and to make sure to see if we can have dollars available to do that into the future too. Does there need to be a pot of money? If so, how much set aside in the future to address those issues? So those are technical data that we'll have and we'll have uh, produced in December to be able to share with folks. But there are a number of other questions that need to be answered to really differentiate between those different scenarios. And this is a task that we're working with both working groups right now, where we're creating criteria to apply to those uh, different scenarios to see which ones are of, of higher value and, and interest. And the goal is then to have a good, better, and best scenario as a result, because there may be multiple ways to address the same problem. Some of those criteria are look at very specific questions. So for instance, what is a cost-effective method? What is sustainable for the long-term amount of, of drinking water that's need, needed in the communities? How do we address future potential changes, whether it's changes in the standards as we learn more of research and if things need to be reacted to differently, or if we find changes in where we find the contaminant? How do we ad ad address that into the future? And so that will help differentiate which of the scenarios uh, make better sense. That's why our good, better, and best as we move forward. In addition, we'll be having conversations with the local units of government and every resident, uh, the residents in, the, in every one of those communities too. And that's why I want to hit on a few key dates. As I mentioned earlier, the more technical information is going to be available in December of this year, and we'll share that on our website, but also be able to push that out through our list servers and other types of media. And then looking for public comment in January and February. We'll be hosting additional community meetings to be able to get feedback so that we'll have some scenarios, cost estimates, and some of those criteria we talked about to get your feedback as we go back and start looking at what are the good, better, and best scenarios. These are, are things that we're going to need to have feedback for because some of them change the way potentially the systems work. Uh, for instance, on private wells in some areas, the option that we may be looking at is hooking up to city water. That's a, a change or bringing water in from another community to serve private wells. That's something we're going to want feedback from not only the residents of the communities but also the local units of government themselves too. And then so uh, with that feedback, apply those criteria that we're working with the, the working groups on in, in March and have a, that good, better, best options. And then afterwards, start with the communities and having those projects being implemented, knowing that there will need to be time for design to be done and then uh, construction. And that money, would, or those activities would be covered by the 3M settlement money. Again, we just want to stress that our goals and number one priority with this work so far is the safe drinking water. We have systems in place to address the near term, the, the, the situation that uh, is happening today on the ground, but the settlement is looking for that long term. We want to do this in a very organized way so when we look and don't rush into something and then 20 years from now say, you know, why did they make that decision? You know, if they spent a, a different time, maybe this other option would have became available or um, more research would have opened up other ideas. And so that's why we're using a very deliberative process. But we also understand it's a balance between um, doing this additional work for a study and, and a actual implementation and activities. It has to be a balance. We like to call it constructive impatience um, to, as we move forward on this. And then finally, again, our 3M Settlement website not only has information on there, all the work group presentations are up there. Uh, this video will also be posted there, but there are fact sheets. And if you'd like to get information, we do have an email list that you could sign up for, which we send out information, including future public meetings or, uh, or notices when things are posted to the website that may be of interest to you. So with that, we've done a lot of talking to you, but we want to make sure that we answer your questions that you may have after this presentation and collect any feedback at this time. We have, as mentioned, just mentioned, a number of folks here to be able to answer your questions, and we've got mics. The one thing we do ask is if you could raise your hand and wait to ask your question until the mic gets to you so that it can be taped and recorded so the rest of the folks who are viewing later can hear those questions and the answers.
So what effect does that have on potential cancer? And I remember a couple of years ago that there was a report that uh, Oakdale Tartan High School students had a higher than normal cancer rate. And as an individual with cancer, I'm just concerned that this could be linked to what caused mine or to others. First of all, I'm sorry to hear of your, your own situation. Um, you know, cancer is, is, is too common in our society. Um, with these chemicals, they're not strongly associated with cancer in, in animals and even sort of less so in humans. One of the large studies of people showed some potential connection or association between exposure to one of these chemicals, PFOA and, and testicular and I think uh, kidney cancer is the other one. Um, but it's not really been proven or that signal has not really been well observed in people or necessarily across different test animal species. We have looked multiple times at cancer incidents in the East Metro and we don't see anything unusual, um, including with those particular kinds of cancers. Um, that isn't, it's not a perfect system. We're not able to, we capture all the cancers that are diagnosed, but if someone lives here and moved away, we're not able to necessarily tie that back. I am aware of, yes, the concerns that were raised about Tartan High School a number of years ago. There, was, there is something unusual about that. However, we have, we have no, no real evidence and no real association between the types of cancers that were observed at Tartan High School, which were a variety of cancers, and this particular situation. It, it, you know, there's, there's not a connection that we can at least can see, um, but it's something we're going to continue to monitor over the coming years. So again, I, I think we can, we can safely say that the rates that we do see aren't, aren't necessarily unusual um, for this particular area, but it's something that we'll continue to follow. Thanks, Ginny. On your first slide that had the cartoon map on it, um, you talked about the directions that the contamination flows towards the rivers. Um, and there was some cross hatching. I wanted to ask about the speed at which those contaminations flow. Uh, they're headed toward my house. <laughs> so um, it, 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 the water can be moving very quickly in some of these aquifers. So the Prairie de Chaine, which is one of the shallower aquifers, it has, um, it's a limestone and it's it's cavernous, basically, and so you actually get sort of tube or pipe flow going on inside there. And so the, some of the flow can be 10,000 feet a day, as measured by the Minnesota Geologic Survey, um, which is really fast. Um, in the um, sandstones, like the Jordan Aquifer, the flow rates would be much slower on the order of you know, feet to tens of feet per day, um, especially if they hit a fracture or something like that, or it can be even slower than that. Um, but the, the, the question we often get is, if the groundwater is moving fast and it's headed to the river and this stuff is soluble, why is it still here? It was dumped in the 40s and 50s, so why is it still here? And, and part of the reason is that we still have those source areas that you know, there's a slow bleeding out of the chemicals. Um, and once you get into an aquifer, there's lots of little back roads. There's the super highways in the Prairie de Chaine where the stuff flew through really fast. But there's the side streets and stuff gets stuck back there and then it slowly works its way back out. And so, so it takes a while for stuff to rinse its way out of a, an aquifer. But the other thing I, I talked about, I think a little bit was at a certain point, you hit a little bit of an equilibrium when you're talking about groundwater flow because things aren't changing. We're not adding more to the system and the flow rates are relatively steady over time. And so these plumes establish and they're being added to at a constant rate and the flow is constant. So they kind of set up and they just, they look like they're just sitting there. So for example, the plume coming out of the Oakdale site, the plume coming out of the Washington County landfill, when they're traveling through groundwater, those tend to be very stable. 
And so the, the wells we've been sampling for 15 years in Lake Elmo, the concentrations don't change much. Over 15 years, we've seen almost no fluctuation. There are some areas we've actually seen quite a bit of reduction in the concentrations because we've had two rounds of removal of waste from these sites. We've had ongoing groundwater extraction. And over time, you know, you get dilution because more clean water is coming from up gradient of those sites and washing through them. So we do see decreasing concentrations up close to the sites because of the cleanup work that's happened. And that slowly propagates its way out through the aquifer as well. And so if you've had a chance to see that um, graph that we had, or the, the map we had up of the Woodbury City Wells, because there's been a lot of concern about the recent one more well getting an advisory recently. But if you look at the graphs for each of those wells, most of them are pretty stable. In fact, um, I had a, oops, a slide. Of, of the wells that have advisories for Woodbury, because they're sort of on the down, you know, part way down on that plume coming out of Oakdale and Lake Elmo, two of the wells have decreasing trends over time. Two of them have stable trends and to have increasing trends. So it isn't like everything's getting worse, you know, as the stuff moves through. Um, it's just that our guidance values keep dropping so we issue more advisories and that's what makes it seem like the situation's getting worse. Um, there are seven other wells that have had detections of PFOA and or PFOS in the city well field and of those, Three have increasing trends, but four have stable or decreasing trends. So the wells that are sort of on the, the southwest part of the well field, they're kind of, we're still on the increasing side of things with them, but the ones, well number one, well number seven, I think it is, well number four, well number six, those have stable or decreasing trends. So it may be that stuff's even starting to kind of push its way through. So. Just because you're down gradient of where that plume seems to be pointing on, on that one map doesn't necessarily mean things are gonna go really badly. They, you know, you, they, the plume may get to you, it may not. It just depends on how stuff evolves over time. And, and part of the reason that the Pollution Control Agency had 3M do all that additional cleanup and removal was so that we'd start seeing some of these improvements and start seeing those plumes get lower in concentration and start shrinking in size over time. So you're blending water in the city wells. How are you not damaging those non-contaminated wells by overworking them just to try and make the water be better with, like in Cottage Grove, you have eight contaminated wells, so you have four that are non-contaminated, aren't they working a lot harder just to blend us enough water so it's below that health advisory? Um, so I am not an engineer. Um, we do have a couple folks from our drinking water protection program, but, but the wells are designed, I mean, they've got more capacity than they are typically pumped at. So it's not gonna damage them to pump them more. Um, that, that's really not gonna harm them. The thing that we would be concerned about is if you pump a clean well and you got contamination over here in a, another well, the concern would be do you then start pulling that contamination towards that cleaner well over time? And so that's one of the concerns um, long-term if you shift around your pumping because of a contamination site. But it's not gonna damage the wells to pump them as long as they're, it's within their the, the, the design capacity for that well. Could it, sh could it shorten these city, I mean, yes, they're designed for it, but if they are working harder than these other wells, is their lifespan shorter? Carla, I'm gonna have you come up. <laughs> it's best not to have geologists pretend to be engineers. <laughs> and I, and while Carla's getting up, there's one thing I just wanna highlight. That's part of the reason, too, that we're looking at long-term. What's being done in the interim is an interim solution, and then why we want a long-term solution to address some of these other items, too. And I'm going to turn it over to Carl. And we actually have public works directors here from Cottage Grove and Woodbury, so they can actually help with more specific questions. But um, essentially, the well casing itself isn't going to degrade if you use it 24 hours versus 8 hours. What does get wear and tear is the pump itself. 
And so you might have to rehab or repair the pump maybe once every four years versus once every six years, um, just because you're using it more frequently. But really, that's the only difference. Um, my question is, um, as far as like the settlement money, so if the plume does move, but all the money has been spent, um, what happens, or are you leaving a contingent fund to help Bayport or you know south of Cottage Grove? A good question. So I mentioned a couple documents that really are important here. One is the 2007 consent order, and one is the, the settlement that we have. So part of what we're looking to do with the settlement is looking and trying to get ahead of certain things uh, long term, but also to have dollars potentially set aside to address that. Now, if every dollar spent out of the settlement, the consent order is still there behind it. And so the consent order has not gone away. So that controlling document would still be there. So prior to the settlement, when wells, private wells exceeded, for instance, the health-based values, it was the consent order that took on those activities. And so there's that system there. Now our goal is with the conceptual drinking water plan is to be able to address those items up front or set aside money for it. But we also then do have as a backup the consent order as needed. So it's a very good question. So uh, I have a various different feelings on this as being part of the City Council of Cottage Grove when the original decree came down and we had to shut down the, the, uh, the water for the summer of uh, 2016. And for my part of it, things don't seem to be moving fast enough because it just seems like I've been to three of these now and the only numbers that change are the number of wells that get contaminated. It doesn't seem like it's ever moving forward. We just hear we're working on it, we're working on it, we're working on it. At least now it looks like we have a date of March 2020 that we'll have a plan, if I understand correctly. Now, there's 720 million immediately available. Is that 720 million still there, or has it been reduced at this point? So the, the, how much is still there? So it's put in the state's general Treasury and has actually increased to 730 million because of interest. And so there is the, the money is still there and has incurred those interest and all that interest comes back to the fund. That's all protected under the agree, under the settlement agreement. So it can't be used by other parts of state government or the legislature. So all the activities that have been taken care of uh, so far where the individual cities have put in requests and for to get them to the point where there's a final solution none of that money has been pulled out of that hundred that from that 720 so anything that is a temporary system you mentioned being from the city of cottage grove there are those temporary systems that are right now treatment systems on the municipal wells those are being covered under the consent order there's a provision there a bridge provision which says up to 40 million up to five years can be used for those interim solutions those temporary solutions anything that would have been a permanent solution is to the settlement. And uh, an example is that uh, mentioned there are homes with private wells, for instance, in Lakeland Shores that have received well advisories. They have a water main hooking up uh, right in front of their home. So instead of putting a treatment system on their private well, we've hooked them up to the city water, and that is a, a, the permanent solution for that individual home. So one, one last question, too, I mm -hmm. guess. And, and you said March of uh, 2020, the final solutions and ideas will be uh, arrived at, is that correct? Correct, yep, that's our scenarios, the good, better, and best scenarios. So once that is arrived at, when is a projected date that actually the solutions will be in place, like the buildings and whatever will be done? Is that, because I know as these wells start having more and more issues, Cottage Grove 8 of 12 now, uh, when will the solutions actually be put in place that will address these mm -hmm. once the final ideas are put in place. Yeah. We'd work with the local units of government and, and set up right away uh, arrangements to provide dollars to them. And so there are, each um, area may see something a little different depending on how much design work is needed to be done. 
but the goal is then to work with the local units of government to provide money to them to start with the implementation of it. So if it's building a new uh, treatment system, that would be money to start with the design and ultimately the building out of those facilities. Kirk, will you, um, I think for some people who might not be aware, go mm -hmm. into a little bit about the recent um, 25 million that cities were able to apply for for expedited projects. And with that, um, in between now and whenever we start mm -hmm. to really see the implementation, do you think there will be times where we'll sort of look at that again, where cities might find that there's new um, issues that have arisen that we need to um, do some more of those temporary fixes and do some of those um, expedited, possibly you know, apply for expedited projects again? Yeah. So as she's referring to during the summer, we had an expedited project uh, request and dollars made available. And this uh, concept is actually from information and, and ideas that we had gotten from the two work groups as to how to make some dollars available at this time while we're still working on the long-term, more global solutions that may have some immediate impacts. And so uh, there was a, a process and a grant had come in. We had gotten advice from the, the work groups and decisions were made. Um, unfortunately, because of the way uh, the state law is written, the exact determination, uh, the state agencies, the two state agencies, MPCA and DNR, cannot disclose all the, the final applicants that receive dollars until each of them have come into an agreement with the state. However, uh, having said that, a number of projects, uh, applicants had received dollars and there have been public notices that have been uh, put out there of communities or applicants that have done uh, moving forward with projects. And unfortunately, because of state law until everyone's completed, we cannot give a full list of those that receive dollars or have not received dollars. Uh, I understand it's frustrating. It's also very frustrating um, for us too. It was something we'd like to, to share. Uh, just for the reason that you mentioned, there are things going on in the interim while we work on this larger uh, plan. Uh, but um, we, and you mentioned, will that happen again? I think that's something we'd like to, to look at too, depending on how quickly some of these long-term um, things start in the motion and if there are needs in between as we cycle through those. So that, that is still a possibility also. Oh, I have a couple questions and I don't know um, which one's gonna be able to answer them. Um, according to that timeline, I think it was 2002 that 3M informed you that they maybe had some water problems at their plant. I was just kind of wondering what, uh, what kind of water problems were they having that they would have been alerted to that? And I don't know if you want me to do all questions or just go one at a time. Let's go one by one. Okay, this okay. is a quick Thanks. answer. So what they told us in their production wells that they were drawing water for their facility, they had detected PFAS in it. And so that's where we were then notified of this and working with the Department of Health and MPCA started working on expanding that investigation. As Ginny had mentioned, if it's there, is it other places? And that's what started off all the work that was done after that. So, so they just were testing their own water for contaminants and they found it. Okay, got it, okay. Um, and then I am one of those lifelong residents. I've been here 50 years and um, five kids all, um, lifelong residents too, and so if these um, contaminants are in our blood, is there some way then or some test that I as a private citizen can go get and, and find those levels and, and then of course um, my girls? That, that's a question that we get fairly often. We did do several rounds of, of biomonitoring in the, in the East Metro. We, we sampled the blood of residents in um, Oakdale and, and those who were on private wells in Lake Elmo and Cottage Grove that had higher levels of PFAS. Um, we certainly detected elevated levels of these chemicals in the blood of the citizens that we, um, we collected samples from, higher than the national averages. That these chemicals are tested in national samples every few years as well. What we've seen is that the, as especially in the residents of Oakdale, after the treatment system went in in 2006, we've seen the levels decline. And they're not quite to the level of the rest of the population yet, but they're, they're heading in that direction. So that, that said, um, there are places, we have an information sheet on our website that has some information about how you could go about getting your blood tested for these chemicals. I would, I would caution you that, that you'll, you'll get it, if someone t does have one of those tests done, you'll get a number back 
Um, but there's nothing we can really tell you about what that number means except to try to compare it to what's been found in other uh, parts of the, of the U.S. population. It's not like cholesterol where your doctor says if it's above a certain number you need to go on a diet or take medication or something like that. It's, it's, we really don't have any, enough knowledge yet to understand if that, what that number might mean. Um, but certainly there are ways to get, that, to get those tests done. And then my, th my third question kind of goes off the Cottage Grove Council member's question. Um, it's been evident for a very long time that there's been contaminants in the water system and at, you know I, I've been floating between Woodbury and Cottage Grove my whole life. Um, and the lawsuit was filed you know nine years ago. Uh, we settled it a year and a half ago. And I'm, ju I'm just, I, I kind of am wondering the same thing. Uh, every year that goes by, um, you know, there's, there's more and more exposure to this. And I'm wondering why in 2010, when we filed it, why weren't we taking a look and figuring it out? Because I'm kind of thinking whether we had a settlement or not, this maybe should have been addressed. Uh, a, a, a little faster than it is. So uh, in 2010, and that activities were still being taken, wells were being sampled, and we had gotten to uh, prior to about 2016 and 17 an equilibrium point. And I think about 200 private wells at that point had over the health-based values in, the, in some municipal wells. What really changed the, the situation was in 16 and 17, where the federal and state health-based values because of additional research and, and a better understanding of PFAS and the potential risk, those numbers dropped. And so it wasn't a change in where the plumes were or sampling, it's now that we were comparing them to, lowers that, to levels that were more stringent to provide the same level of protection. And that's what kicked off, for instance, in uh, 2017, the Cottage Grove, a number of wells, and as mentioned, the, the difficult situation the community faced uh, where there was the watering ban, and, and then ultimately treatment systems have been put on a couple of wells temporarily to address the issue as we then look at the long-term situation. And so as things have gone, uh, work has continued always on it, but as information be has become more available, it has changed the, the, under, um, the overall framework of what we were operating under. This should be a fairly quick question, but um, we've talked for months about this, and we often talk in terms of health-based values, but up here on the screens today, you've had health risk index, or HI. Can you just explain, is that the same, or is that different? They're essentially the same thing. The, we, when we do that additive approach, um, we take the individual health risk limits, or health-based values. Um, they become the denominator in that, oh, it's up there somewhere. Um, they become the denominator in that, that equation. So we divide the concentration by its individual health base value or health risk limit. The sum total of that we refer to as a, as a hazard index or a health risk index. So it's just, they're kind of two different names for the same thing. It's, it's basically using the criteria we developed as, and comparing the water concentrations to them in, in one of several ways to determine if uh, the levels are too high for human consumption. Jim, early on you talked about the risk to infants, uh, fetuses, um, and I wondered what the definition was of infants or really I'm worried about, um, you know, at what level. You talked about, um, sorry, I'm struggling with the question, that the younger children are consuming more water and it's building up. And I'm wondering, like, at what level? I have a three-year-old. That's what I'm worried about. At what level? At oh, what age? age. Yeah. Um, so 
infants, because they, virtually all their liquids come through, or their food comes through liquid, they're, they're consuming much more liquid per their body weight. As a child grows, that it starts to decline, the, the amount of liquid per their body weight declines until probably, you know, early adolescence probably, when they're starting to become closer to, to full-sized. It's really the most concern earliest in life, um, where the, when those levels are highest, as, as well, those are the, the more key developmental periods that the bodies and the systems are developing, so that's really the time period you really want to prevent that exposure from being very high. When you say it that way, then isn't any PFAS in the water too high? If they know it's getting into, you know, infants and children and could impact their development? So in, in that case too, then would you lower the health advisory limits? The, the values that we, we developed are based on the best science that we have. And, and that science has changed over the years. You're, you're right. We've, those numbers have declined. They've gotten lower as we've learned more about these chemicals. Right now, the, the number we have for PFAS is 15 parts per trillion, which is really not far above our ability to even detect it in the first place. So we're, we're just about at the level where if you detect it, it's probably time to do something about it. Um, whether that's going to continue or not, I, I don't have a crystal ball, I can't say for sure, but the numbers we have now are based on the best science that we have available to us. Um, we, we've, we've really put a lot of effort into understanding this and, and done some really great work and published some scientific papers about how we've gone about this and other states are starting to pick up on that methodology and looking very closely at what we're doing. So I'm pretty confident we've done the best job that we're able to do at this point. Um, the filtration systems, when they are put in place, they, they treat them down to essentially non-detectable levels, and that's the good news, is that when treatment is used, um, they're not simply trying to meet that exposure level. It pretty much takes it all out. Uh, so I think that helps get us to that point where it's no longer a concern once those treatment systems go in, until we get to the point where the environments, the, the aquifers are cleaned up enough where we don't have to deal with this any longer. With that, so then when you are thinking about the conceptual um, water system plan, or I can't remember the correct terminology, um, is the goal then to set up a plan that will address water regardless of whether or not it's exceeded whatever the value is today? Um, and then again, potentially looking forward to possibly lower standards and so forth. So that is one of our questions that are built into the criteria, and we've been having conversations with the work group. There's really a, a two parts of the question built in there. It's if you detect it someplace, uh, which wells provide alternative water, whether it's treatment or alternative water from a different source. And then when you do do that, for instance, if you treat it, how far do you come down? The technologies that we're looking at, granular activated carbon, you probably hear us refer to it as GAC or ion exchange, are ones, as Jim said, once the treatment is put on, it's brought down for those uh, PFAS compounds that we're concerned about down to non-detect levels. But that is something, how do we um, address the future values? And do you do things now to do that? Do you put money away? Those are some of the conversations. As we get cost estimates, we'll have uh, more in-depth conversations on. So my question is, like, how do you treat this? Like, so GAC, I think, is just, like, at a household level, but I don't know what, like, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. You know what, I, I don't know how to phrase that question, really. So uh, a GAC is something that can be used at the municipal level. See here the, the, the one picture with the larger vessels, those are larger vessels being used at a municipality, and that is a, a carbon system um, where water goes through one and goes through a second one. Um, and then as soon as we start seeing breakthrough through the first one, we start changing them out. And the second one is still providing that protection. That's the same thing that's done on the home version that you see in the, the corner. It's those two vessels, just much smaller to deal with uh, at home. So. Carbon, um, granular activated carbon systems, the GAC systems can be used in both a city system and individual home systems. And that's 
So the question was, will that address the, the groundwater? And it doesn't. It only is what's coming up through the well and treated before it goes to someone who, who may be drinking it. Uh, unfortunately, the ability to treat the, wa the contamination in the groundwater, there's not a technology at this time. It's pump it up and, and treat it. And it's unrealistic to be able to pump up the water and, and send it back down because it may become potentially, as Jenny mentioned, if there are, are spots, recontaminated. It's unfortunately one of the legacies and why um, prevention on contamination is so important to our agency's work because well, we can do some treatment and we can do some cleanup. We can't get everything, unfortunately. So if the carbon filters are an easy uh, and safe, brings it down to safe levels, is it the cost then that's preventing uh, cities from using it to make our water safe? I mean, I, I'm feeling like there's 700 and, what'd you say, 30 or 40 million dollars, and I understand that there's some long term, but I just keep thinking how long, for every year that goes by, you're going to come up with new science and new, uh, you know, it's a never ending thing. So when do we say we have to start treating the water and protecting our long-term citizens that are here. So just to, to start off, the cities are working with the Department of Health and MPCA and do regular sampling of their water and, and are providing it and making sure that it's below those health-based values so it is safe. So just to, to start with, uh, the, the water is coming through the municipal systems in these communities are uh, below that health-based value and safe. So the question is, why not uh, put treatment on all the wells there's, that's where the logistics come into it also is how do you do that? Do you build one treatment system that addresses five or six wells or multiple communities? Do you provide water? Um, going back to some of those other options we looked at. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Do you um, build new well fields? There are well fields within the East Metropolitan Area where you're not having the contamination. Do you look at other alternative water bringing in from other areas? Or if you're on private wells, do you come together in a neighborhood system that builds one treatment system to, to deal with everyone? So there are different ways to do that. And the question is, what is the most cost effective way to do that and to make sure that something is sustainable long term? And so that's what we're trying to, to figure out at this point as we move forward. Correct. And there, and there is the existing water going to the communities are being blended, and, and communities have treatment to be able to be under that health-based value and provide safe drinking water. I mean, I understand the blending, and so we take the you know the high levels and we blend it with the lesser levels to give us even lesser. But but it is still concerning to know that there are still things for long-term residents that have been drinking blended water for you know, high levels and now blended water. And I understand that the water that is coming out of our tap is supposedly on the safe side for what we know today. Uh, next year we may find something else out. Um, but if we can get that water down to zero, the question is, is why do we continue to wait? Why hasn't this been looked at for the 10 years that this lawsuit has been going on? Because it hasn't gotten better. I mean, we've known that, we've known about this issue for a long time. So, again, the, the information going back to 10 years, we had hit that equilibrium. At a certain point, though, there was information, so for instance, on the consent order under the state and federal requirements, there do have to be exceedances of health-based values so for the consent order to kick into. And so that is one of the, the factors. Now with the settlement, that does for the first time provide us more flexibility in how we use that. So we can look at some of those options. Are there things to be done with wells that may not at this point be over health-based values? That money is available for the first time through the settlement to be able to do that. What we're looking for is how to do that in the most effective way to provide answers for all 14 communities, not only today, but into the future. And that is a longer effort to, to do that type of, of work. But in the meantime, dollars are being made available to provide those communities and individual well owners with water that does not exceed the health-based values and is safe for consumption. Um, just one quick question. Are we, 
attempting to find a 100-year solution here? In other words, are, is this something that as long as people are living in mm -hmm. Washington County are going to have to deal with 100 years, 200 years, that this never will ever stop bleeding out? So as mentioned earlier, these, the, the PFAS, once they're in nature, we do not have a way to, to remove them. And they are at times referred to as forever chemicals. So this is something we're looking long term. As we're doing the planning, we're not only looking at the population and the build out of the communities today, but also in 2040, and need to think about what is needed to be available into the future. Because this is not something that will be answered in a number of years or, or decades. Unfortunately, the camp contamination in the groundwater is, is there. I know that's not a, a, a happy thought, unfortunately. Could you flip back to the granule activated carbon filter, the residential? Nope, sorry, wrong way. <clears throat> so the, the photo on the right, um, Echo Water Systems out of Woodbury, if I recall correctly, I did some research a couple years ago. That's 35 to $40 a month rental. Um, I just wanted to say that out loud. Thank you. Um, I ha have a question about the well water at home, too. You can get these home water treatment systems, and you put uh, pleated filters or carbon filters. How are those the same or different than what the carbon GAC systems do? And then following on to the gentleman's statement, is that rental fee covered by this fund, or will it be? for the GAC systems? So I'll answer the second half of the question and on uh, the off-the-shelf products, I'll go to defer. Uh, the question is, uh, so when a well advisory is issued to a municipality or to, uh, for instance, you're talking about a private well, what happens is at the same time that come, letter comes out from the Department of Health, another letter comes from the MPCA to work with our contractors to provide a whole home treatment system or some alternative drinking water. Those costs are being covered by the consent order now in the near term and the, um, in, the, in the temporary phases here. And long term, we're finding the solution on how that would be covered by the, the settlement. So those costs are being, when a well advisory is issued, those costs are being uh, borne by one of those two funding sources. Um, it, it's hard to comment on different types of available home systems. We, back in 2007, 2008, the Health Department commissioned a, an independent study because we wanted to be sure that carbon filtration or whatever we chose would actually do the job. And so we tested the what's called point of entry or point of use systems, residential scale. We tested ion exchange, uh, reverse osmosis, both with and without carbon polishing filters, and then granular activated carbon. Um, and all of, uh, most of them performed quite well. Um, ion exchange just was still kind of a newer thing and we didn't have a lot of experience with it. Reverse osmosis isn't good f as a, an option for whole house treatment because it, it's a very slow process and it only generates so much water at any given time. And so, and it also creates concentrated wastewater. And since most people on a private well are on a septic system, the last thing we wanted was concentrating these contaminants into the waste stream that get, goes into their septic tank and goes on its merry way. So the choice was carbon filtration. And they're oversized for the the contaminant concentrations and they're changed out more frequently than is necessary to be sure that we're getting everything. So that being said, we th reverse osmosis should be a good option and some of, some of the ion exchange materials should be a good option. As we've been doing private well testing, occasionally someone will say, I have my own treatment system, either because they don't want to take the state system, they just want to use their own, or they just say, will you grab a filtered sample while you're sampling my unfiltered water? And some of those systems work great, and they're taking everything out. And some of them are lousy and are taking nothing out, and a lot of them are somewhere in between. And we don't know why that is. It might be because of maintenance issues. The membrane on the reverse osmosis may have been torn. They might have the wrong kind of ion exchange 
resins in so so we don't know and we can't you know in do an assessment on every individual system which is why we've tried to kind of standardize with the carbon filtration systems that we install um, we have done testing on the little faucet mounted filters um, because we wanted to at least be able to tell people would it be even worth doing that as an interim measure or if we tell you, hey, your water meets our standards, but if you're still worried, here's something you can do. To Those little faucet-mounted filters do a bang-up job. Um, and so we have an information sheet on our website about um, faucet-mounted filters. The ones we tested were the little pure, P-U-R ones that you can get at any hardware store. And, I can put it on a tap so anybody can, because as I mentioned, not an engineer. So um, those do a great job. We tested them against the Oakdale city water, which is some of the most contaminated water in the, the area, the East Metro. And it removed all of the PFOS, PFOA, everything except towards the very end of the life of that little filter. It, it'll do 100 gallons. Um, we saw a little bit of breakthrough of PFBA, but that's you know, that's true with any carbon filter. The thing that's not worth using for this kind of contamination are those little pitcher filters. I know everybody thinks they're great and they do a great job with stuff that tastes bad in your water, but they do not do a good job at removing of dissolved chemical contaminants. And we've tried them on solvents and they don't do a good job and they did a lousy job on PFAS. So I would not rely on those. We've not done testing on the filters in your refrigerator, but those are pretty well manufactured and those are, you know, there's a lot of quality control on them, just like the little faucet mounted filters. They're probably better engineered and that's probably why they get better contact with the carbon and better removal. So those are two things that, you know, aren't real expensive, could give you a little bit extra. Um, reassurance if you've got a little bit in your water but not enough to exceed our levels and you want to take it all out then that's what I would suggest doing. I've got two questions. The first, um, as long as we're talking about filtration, um, uh, is it primarily a concern of consuming the water or do we also have to be worried about you know showering in the water or clothes being washed in the water? Um, how, how does the body absorb the, yeah. uh, the chemicals? If, there, if there's any good news about these chemicals is, as Jim mentioned, they're surfactants. And if you, we all know what a surfactant is, we just might not call it that, and soap is a surfactant. They're film formers. They, they were designed to make coatings and films. And so they don't readily absorb across our skin boundary. And so testing has shown that there's very little absorption across your skin. The primary exposure route, especially in areas like this where the, gr the drinking water is contaminated, is the use of the water for drinking and cooking purposes. Um, they are not volatile. The P the, these, what we sometimes refer to as these terminal PFAS, the ones that don't break down in the environment, they're also not volatile. So there's the second good piece of news because at least we don't have the problem that we have at some sites where the stuff Vol evaporates off the water and comes up through your basement and, and contaminates the air in your house. Well, similarly, they're not evaporating off your water inside your house and you're not inhaling them that way. So really, if we treat your drinking and cooking water, that's what's going to um, knock out the vast majority of exposure. What we can't get at is that sort of baseline exposure that all people whether you know throughout the industrial world and beyond, all people seem to have these chemicals in their blood because they've gotten out into the environment and been globally distributed. And we don't even know all the ways that people are exposed, but, um, but really it's this drinking water and cooking water route that, that really is what elevates people's blood concentrations. Okay. And second question was, um, so we have these, these sites where the chemicals have been dumped that we're seeing chemicals leach off it. Uh, does that imply that there hasn't been enough cleanup done at those sites? Or, or is it deemed that those sites have been cleaned up as well as they can and it's just that there's, there's so much that's leached into the, the ground around that area that, that we continue to see it, uh, see it going into the, the water? Yeah, I'm gonna, do you wanna take that, sure. Kurt? Or? 
So the disposal sites have been dug up and for the three 3M locations that has been transferred to a modern landfill in Rosemont. The Washington County landfill was picked up, a liner, a double liner, or triple liner system, excuse me, was put underneath it, waste put back on top of it, and a cap put on to encapsulate it. So we removed the, as much of the source as possible. However, as mentioned, it has been leaching out into the, to the groundwater and to, to other areas where it is still there. We have uh, pumping systems around those 3M disposal sites to, to pick up stuff that may still be at those sites and try to capture it before it goes off site. But because, uh, so we have removed the source to help prevent the, the problem from lasting on to the future, but there's still its presence in the groundwater and that's what we're still seeing today is that issue. Do you guys have any information um, regarding proper disposal of these filters after their, their useful life? So the systems on the home systems and the, the, the city systems here, those are taken care of through the state and often what they're done is the carbon is, is recharged, it's, it is uh, applied to, to heat and then the, the uh, heat is what destroys the, the PFAS at very high temperatures. And so that's what's done on the systems that are being provided to the local units of government and to the actual uh, homeowners on these GAC type systems. I don't see any more hands. As mentioned before, uh, if you're interested in, in keeping being kept up to date on this, please sign up for our email list server on our website. We'll have folks outside to be able to answer some more questions if you uh, have them or are just don't want to ask them in front of a room full of people. And if tomorrow morning you wake up and you have that question, oh, I wish I had asked, our website has an email address and we can make sure we get the question to the correct person either at the Department of Health, MPCA, or DNR to be able to get your response. So thank you very much uh, for this evening. We, we appreciate your time and uh, have a good night.